Hi, uh, my name is Kem. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, today uh, we are going to talk about uh, some of uh, compiler optimizations and I will be citing uh, GCC and Clang in between and in some cases you will see you know what you could do with one another. Um, so not necessarily these optimizations are something that will get you a better code or faster code but uh, you know the uh, you'll understand what these optimizations are and uh, how you could effectively use it for your um, for making your code more effective and uh, we'll learn that um, while generally they are good, uh, they may not be good, you know, it depends upon um, where you're applying. So we'll be covering few of the optimizations that, uh, um, you know, are uh, going to be covered here, but there are a lot more. So I'll have links in there you can go and look for and um, see which one fits your needs. So. Um, so I'll just introduce uh, a little bit of the compilers. Uh, and um, uh, Clang is a relatively newer compiled infrastructure. It's uh, built on top of LB LLVM. Um, it has uh, limited front ends, uh, can do C, C++, and Objective-C. Um, and uh, besides Clang, there are several other tools um, that are available on LLVM projects. So if you're interested, uh, go have a look. They have uh, a lot of nice tools, like uh, there's a Clang scan, which can do you know, static analysis. Uh, then there's a Clang tidy, helps you write um, C++ code. And um, I'm thinking the list is very long. So see if any of those tools you can utilize in your workflow. Um, and they might be handy. Um, it was released in 2003, and uh, the latest uh, stable release right now is 3.9 uh, as of December last year, and uh, 4.0 is coming out, I think, in a month's time. So they're in RC <coughs> stage already. And um, a lot of people call it C-Lang, but actually it is pronounced as Clang. So, in GCC, I think most of uh, us, we know what GCC is here. Uh, it's the GNU compiler suite. Um, and uh, it can be built both native and cross compiler. So there are cross compilation infrastructures like build root, you know, open embedded, and several other, which can build tool chains for cross architectures. And uh, it has uh, many language front ends. So there is CC++, uh, Fortran, Ada, Golang, uh, there are a few others uh, that you will see. So it has a lot more front ends compared to um, Clang, for example. Um, and it's modular in nature, uh, meaning that it has the concept of front end, middle end, back end. Um, so it supports multiple architectures. If you compare the list of architectures, uh, GCC has way more architectures. I provided a small link here. Um, if you go and check this link, you will see, you know, it's uh, almost every architecture on Earth, you will find there's a support in GCC. Uh, Clang only supports a handful of them right now. Um, you know, ARM, Intel, uh, x86, RPC, MIPS, to name a few. And then there are a few others, but uh, not as many as, as uh, GCC does. So if, if you're working on any of those architectures, you know, Clang may not be an option for you yet. Um, uh, the latest stable release is uh, 6.3, again, uh, during December timeframe. And uh, the next major release will be 7.0, probably late this summer this year. Um, that will come out. So um, both compilers have a major release once a year, roughly. And, uh, and then there are point releases, which are kind of bug fix releases that happen over a period of months uh, for some time until the next major release comes. So it's uh, pretty predictable when the new compiler is going to come out. Um, so we'll start with the optimization flags, uh, so the minus O flags. Um, so minus O flags are actually collection of optimizations underneath. And I'll show how you can uh, see what's, what it is doing underneath. So um, 
O0 is unoptimized, uh, which means uh, it applies no optimization, simple conversion from your C code to assembly, and then puts it out there. So it's uh, um, generally um, unoptimized code, but might work always. Is this uh, the default? It is not the default. Um, you can use it if you are debugging some issues in your code or, and stuff like that. Uh, O1 is general optimization. Um, it doesn't do any trade-offs um, for speed or size. Uh, it applies optimizations generally, which doesn't affect either of, um, you know, doesn't degrade any of your uh, conflicting um, requirements like debug info or code, or code speed compilation and size like that. Um, O2 is more aggressive. Um, and it can eff affect your um, size. It can also um, have some speed optimization. It, it can <laughs> apply additional optimizations. Uh, O3 is uh, a bit more aggressive. It applies some inlining, and so you can have more code, um, but um, it may run faster. Again, you have to see whether it really runs fast or not, but uh, it may be that if your architecture supports it, most probably it will run faster. Um, OS is optimizations for size. It is like O2. Um, and, uh, but it uh, favors code size, so it will not, uh, it will eliminate the passes, the individual optimization passes, which increases size. So there's a new switch called OFAST. Um, so it can do O3, and it can basically add some inaccurate mathematics uh, in, inaccurate math calculations, which are not compliant with IEEE maths. Um, so if you are okay with that, um, you know, you, uh, you, if your workloads are fine, you can uh, enable that um, optimizations for you. OG, uh, OG is uh, um, for debugging experience. So most of the time people use minus O2, minus G, and then Many times you see that you know you don't get accurate debug experience. So sometimes you are when you are debugging uh, a source level debugging, then you are flipping around the lines and stuff like that. Um, OG is uh, is designed for giving you a good debug experience. At the same time, having certain optimizations apply, so you are not debugging totally O0 code, uh, essentially. Um, Clang has another uh, option called minus O Z, um, which is um, which optimizes for size even more. What it does is it disables all loop vectorizations. Um, GCC didn't do that, so it, it can basically, in theory, generate a more a more compact code. So another difference you'll see is by, uh, when you use minus O, minus O translates to one of these uh, levels. And in Clang, it translates to O2. And in GCC, it translates to O1. Um, so uh, it's an um, interesting fact to know when you're using that option. So uh, feel free to ask questions or comments in between. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, could you repeat? Um, by default, it should be using minus O1 uh, or minus O option. Yeah. So you mentioned OG is better for debugging, but usually O0 is, is good for debugging too. Yeah. Can you verify why it's better to use OG for debugging? Yeah, so O0 applies no optimizations at all. So, you know, it's like. Uh, Whatever compiler generates the code, uh, it'll just emit the same code. But with OZ, it'll still apply the optimizations. That, for example, doesn't degrade your debug experience. Okay. Some level of optimizations you get. Okay. Yes. Yes, so that's a good point as well. So um, some 
uh, code, um, they check for you know optimization flags, right? So they, well, when you enable optimizations, there is a underscore underscore optimize underscore underscore defined by compiler. So they depend on those things and they will check for those things. Uh, so talking of optimization flags, uh, in GCC there is a way um, to see what all different passes it will generate uh, or it will run. So if you do uh, verbose asm and dump it with, uh, just generate the assembly output. Uh, I've only given a few uh, options, but you, if you do it, it, there is a huge list that you will see. So all those optimization passes are enabled. For example, this is output for minus O2. Um, O1, O0, you know, in all those uh, options you can map here and you can see which options are enabled or which passes are enabled at particular O levels. Um, there is another option in GCC, uh, which is uh, I've given here, which is a optimizer's help. Um, it also gives you a nice formatted output of every optimizer and tells whether it is enabled at this level or not. So. If you are looking particularly for a specific optimizer uh, and its state, use this option and it gives you a nice formatted output um, that you can uh, use to determine. So um, when you enable this O options and you see that you need to disable one of the optimizations that they enable by default, you can very well do that. Um, just specify a minus F no for that option. Uh, for example, in this uh, uh, case, I'm just saying F no aggressive loop optimizations, and uh, and you can see that um, that's reflected uh, in the uh, option passes right there. Um, so uh, you can look at the uh, specific optimiz optimization options. Uh, I've provided that link here. There's uh, a lot of documentation. I highly recommend that you know go through those. Um, they explain it really well on what each pass do. So as you can see, a minus O means a lot. When compiler is working underneath, it's doing a lot with your code. Um, so uh, we'll talk about a little about aliasing. Um, so there are options in compiler to um, enable, you know, Strict aliasing helps the compiler to generate better code when you know if your code has aliasing problems. Um, it's better to either avoid them um, by using strict aliasing in your code itself or um, specifying or helping the compiler basically to follow the strict aliasing rules. Um, you can find out whether it's uh, uh, having the aliasing issues by using the warning. Uh, to find where it is violating those rules. Um, and C99 has the restrict keyword. So when you know this, your pointers are not aliasing, uh, use restrict keyword. And that helps compiler know that it can apply the optimizations because you've informed that these pointers don't alias. Um, so, um, so if you see the, the, the code that I'm showing here, uh, the first function, uh, is aliasing because uh, the aliasing rules say that same types can alias. So it won't apply good, you know, uh, the optimizations there. But in the second example, uh, the rules say that, you know, the different types cannot alias. So in theory, the function is same, uh, doing the same stuff, but the second function will generate more optimized code um, because of the uh, strict aliasing rules. Um, Sometimes we do conversions. And uh, just keep in mind, when you do conversions, that can result in aliasing as well. So if in this example, for example, I passed long, and uh, if I came into the function and I typecasted it back to int, then the effect will be similar to the first function. Um, so you can help compiler by following these rules. and. Uh, um, and another thing, there are bugs also in, in compilers. At least, you know, GCC has had a history of bugs. And uh, as of 6.0, this issue was fixed where uh, uint eights were not, or int eights, or uint eights were not uh, um, uh, treated at same level as uh, unsigned char and char. 
um, so they would uh, they would break the aliasing rules. Uh, this has been fixed in 6.0. So if you're not using uh, 6.0 GCC, you're using older one, you might be uh, having that bug in your compiler. Um, so it's important that uh, with aliasing, you know, you kind of uh, either help the compiler by letting it know or write your code so, you know, compiler has um, less work to do. Um, so inlining, um, you can use inline keywords to hint the compiler. So inline will not inline, uh, but it will hint the compiler that you intend to make this function inlineable. Um, you, you can force inline functions with some um, function attributes, and uh, if you see, um, always inline is a uh, function attribute that you can use, and that will uh, force the compiler to inline the function. Um, GCC actually has three different uh, implementations for inline. So if you're using older compiler, which didn't default to C99, uh, you will get one behavior, uh, which is a GNU89 inline. And then if you use C99, which is a default for the recent GCCs, so the default will be the C99 inline behavior, and then there is C++ inlining if you're using C++, so um, um, be aware of that. So inlining um, is an interesting uh, optimization. Uh, a lot of people do it, and uh, um, it may help you, it may not help you. So it really depends upon how big your uh, function is, for example, and if you do excessive inlining, uh, by using force in line, knowing that you know better than compiler, uh, you might um, create you know uh, a large uh, function blocks which are basically spilling over your cache. So you might not be able to use instruction cache as efficiently as you could otherwise. In some cases, it might be opposite. If your function is small and you do inlining in say loop or something, and the function is small enough and it fits into your instruction cache lines you can get a lot of performance boost. So, um, so it's important to understand that you know, when you apply inlining, uh, look at the code. I always say that. Look at the code, what GCC is doing, or any compiler is doing it with your code. If it is inlining, look at what it is inlining. And, um, and secondly, many times, um, it's important to know your profile also. You might inline a function that might increase the code, but that might not be a hot function. So overall, your performance still might be, yeah, nothing, right? So you have to know where the inlining is most effective because um, um, it does have penalty in terms of code size. And uh, um, so uh, generally, uh, keeping those uh, uh, things in mind, probably you can effectively use the inline uh, keyword. In the older compilers, you know, it, it didn't have heuristics to determine what to inline, what not to inline. Newer compilers are very good at determining, you know, the inline limits and identifying a function is inlineable or not. Um, so many code that's written, you know, people have forced inlining. Um, that becomes quite static, architecture to architecture. When you port that code to another processor, that may not work as well as it worked on that old MIPS processor. So it's good to let compiler decide on it and then take control when you have issues and uh, you know that this function should be in line for this uh, particular case. Then you can use the always in line attribute. Um, so uh, stack optimization, so it's, uh, it's quite uh, interesting. Uh, there is um, a diagnostics option. Uh, you can see if you use this F stack usage, uh, it can dump the information in a separate file about how much stack is being used by a function. So you can um, get that uh, value and you can do some uh, maths you are doing about how much stack you know, your call chain may use. Um, and uh, that might help you to, um, to redesign your function or algorithm. And um, you could look at whether, you know, the local data, local variables, they contribute towards stack. Function parameters, they contribute towards stack. 
Yeah, so if you write functions with so many parameters, you know, uh, you might want to avoid that. You might want to pass them as pointers to structures and stuff like that. Um, and then if you are returning structures, right, uh, by value, uh, that they can also uh, add to um, stack usage. Or if you're using uh, a lot of local allocations. Um, so watch out for those things. And uh, this is a good um, uh, option. Um, so if you are using stack a lot, um, then see if you are using recursive functions. They are bad for uh, uh, stack. And uh, if you are using, using uh, deep call chains, um, you know, in some cases I've seen um, call chain going into hundreds, right? Um, and uh, and in so those cases, you can curtail if you can. Uh, that would improve your stack usage. And um, you can also put a warning, a W stack usage. It's a good option. Um, that tells you my stack size, if it grows above that, then please warn me. Um, so if you are on a uh, limited system, a limit constraint system, which uh, to a certain extent all systems are, it depends upon what your limits are, um, this is a good option to, to put in. So your builder breaks, and then you know that you know, somebody has added a function that's uh, going over the limits. So um, F conserve stack, uh, this is uh, um, option so all these options, by the way, I didn't find in Clang. They are all GCC options. Um, and uh, fconserve stack tries to minimize the stack size. Um, so it will try to reuse locals and uh, um, not allocate, um, duplicate locals and like that. So code might run slower because he has to uh, spill over and reload and stuff like that. So, um, But uh, this is an option if you are um, um, looking at optimizing your stack usage, you might want to use it. Um, so for size optimizations, uh, most of them are taken care by optimization for size. So if you use OS, it uses a whole uh, bunch of optimizations. And um, uh, in addition, you can also try to, to um, use your uh, stack boundary. So you want to have your stack alignment to say eight or 16. Generally it is 16 on x86 and um, you can make it eight. Um, in this case, the accesses will slow down, um, but your functions will use less amount of stack. So, um, and uh, both compilers I saw, they have an option, uh, just that options are a little different. Um, and, um, um, you can use another option uh, called merge constants, so you can uh, let compiler work harder on finding similar constants, and then it will merge them. Uh, and uh, that will be, um, um, you know, reducing your uh, total size eventually. And uh, as you can see, GCC Clang both has that option, just the options are named differently. And um, omit frame pointer. Um, that is um, one option that you would you can try. It uh, removes um, certain instructions from you know your uh, your function entry points, um, but debugging will suffer. So if you want to have debugging a good debugging experience, um, you might want to keep it. So uh, it's a trade-off at that point. If you want to make that, some people do. In some cases, some, some functions you might want to do that. You are pretty sure those functions you never debug. You might want to enable that. And in some areas where you think that you, you want to debug or you might have issues, there you might want to keep it enabled. So it's a, again, as I was saying, it's a mix. Identify your loads and then enable these options accordingly. So um, one size doesn't fit all. Um, so these are two options that I wanted to highlight, F function sections, F data sections. Um, both compilers have this option. And what they do is they have separate else sections for each function. And then similarly for global data, 
uh, and also uh, initialized data, they uh, create separate sections. So when you enable garbage collection in the linker, um, linker is better able to find out unused functions, for example. So it's able to throw a lot of code away. But if you don't use these options, then there is a single text section that is available for, you know, um, in the end in the object file for the linker, and it may not be able to identify a lot to remove. So, um, but when you use these uh, options, many times code breaks. The reason is because now everything gets into their own sections and you might have entry points. And uh, linker might not see that as entry point and it might see, oh, I don't have any call chain here. This whole function um, list is unused. So there are ways in the, in the um, um, compiler to identify your functions that I use them, they're used. So, um, so keep that in mind when you switch to these options. Uh, you, know, you might see smaller code, but then it may not run. And then usually the problems are like this, where you haven't identified your code um, for entry points, because that's what linker is going to use when it is trying to find out which functions aren't used and which data is not used. So, um, so these are a few points that can help you to reduce the code size along with the general optimization for size options that we talked about earlier. Um, so I want to talk about the, um, the profile guided optimizations, the PGO. Um, it's, um, it's, it's quite um, uh, useful. Uh, nowadays in newer compilers, uh, they work really, really well. Um, and uh, what they do is they kind of help the compiler to feed data, actually execution data, that it can t use to optimize further. So there are uh, basically two kinds of uh, profile-guided optimizations you will find. One is more like statistical in nature. Um, it's, it can do less, but it's low overhead. And then the other one is instrumented. Um, so it's, um, it can do more accurate stuff, can give you more options, uh, optimize your code more. But it's quite intrusive. At least you know it has double build things you have to do um, you know a instrumented build and then run it uh, and then get the instrumented data and then run again um, uh, instrumented compile so um, um, what you can do is uh, there are these options that I've uh, mentioned here f profile generate so there are these steps you will have to do for a more precise uh, collection of data um, when you run the instrumented code with your training data, um, that is, you know, whatever inputs you are feeding into your application, um, it will generate extra files. So you need to have file system on the device. So it has a lot of uh, uh, requirements from that regard. If you are doing embedded system development, you have to make room for those things where it can write files. And then you have to be able to, you know, take those files off the box and then feed it back into your um, compile process. So if you are doing cross comp compilation, uh, this can be a little, um, you know, involved process. Uh, however, they do, uh, uh, they help you optimize your code a lot more. So uh, the third step after you have collected the data is to build your, uh, your <laughs> code by using this profile data. Um, so, there is a lot that happens underneath, but overall what you see is um, it's feeding in information about, you know, is that path taken if is taken more than else or else is taken more than if. So all that data is collected and it is, is annotated. So when it is recompiling your code, it is annotating that data and feeding that information into compiler. So that's an additional information that compiler will use uh, in this in this pass here when you are doing the uh, build and it will be able to use branching properly right so he knows that this branch is taken more often than the other one so he's going to optimize using that value range so yeah so the profile creation certainly destroys binary readability as, as it's sampling based 
Um, if you feed the same profile in, do you get the same results out each time? Um, also, it depends upon your training data, really. And you know, you might have it's a live system. You have interrupts and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I don't think you will be able to regenerate same kind of profile data every time. Right, but if you save your profile data, you treat the same. Is that repeatable? That is repeatable. It's a static compile most of the time. But um, m many times, what you do is you you do many runs. Right, you got 10% and you're excited, you want 11 next time, and suddenly you see this time it's nine. The reason is that, you know, that the training data you fed might be still same, but system might be processing other stuff in the meanwhile. So uh, generally, it, it is um, in the range that you get uh, improvements. Um, so um, as I mentioned before, it's a little harder to use because, um, you know, the instrumented run and then collection, collecting data, feeding it back into your uh, system. So it's a bit of um, involved process. And then because you're compiling the code two times, um, you know, it also uh, degrades your compile time. Um, and it's quite tedious when you feed a lot of accurate data into it. So compiler is doing, taking more time to compile your code. Um, so uh, there is a, a, a lighter version. It's called auto FDO. Uh, and I provided a link for that. Um, it uses perf, uh, and it's more sampling-based um, profile. So it um, it is a lot faster, and it, it is not going through. So all these things are happening underneath, and you're not going through you know the 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 three steps that we were talking about. Um, but again, it's a sampling-based data, so it's not instrumented code. You might miss right if your function is running like it's a small function and it's, it's, it's within your samples, then you might even totally miss it, right? So, um, so it, it, it gives a good results, but instrumented one is much better. But then you have to pay more to use it. Um, so um, link time optimizations. Um, so when you are compiling your code, Compiler sees file by file, right? So you have your uh, compilation unit, which is a single file. So that's the view it has. What link time optimizations do, it gives a whole program view to the compiler. So it's able to do a lot more on a function. For example, if you have a global function and nobody's using it, so he doesn't know until he has the whole program view. At that point of time, it knows. Even if it is global, it's not used by anyone. Um, and then there are other optimizations it can apply. So both compilers can do LTO. And uh, this example here uh, is showing how you would do that with, uh, with Clang. So um, what it does is it generates the, um, the LLVM bitcode uh, for your, um, your um, source, source file. Um, and uh, with LTO, again, the problem is similar to um, what we had with PGO. So there are also two versions, a thin version, and then there is a, a more fat version, which is, uh, you know, can do a lot more, um, and we'll talk about that. Um, so what it does is um, it generates this bitcode information about, um, you know, the symbols and types and all that uh, intermediated data. Uh, and then it emits that into your object file. Um, and then when you are linking um, and you have to specify the FLTO option, then what's going to happen is, uh, with Clang, I think you didn't need to even specify that option. It can identify that there is a LTO data. But with GCC, you have to tell it that you have to use FLTO. And then it will in invoke the link time optimizer. So what it does is you invoke the compiler, it has a plugins that invokes the linker, and then linker uh, plugin is able to invoke optimization passes because the metadata to do all those optimizations is in the, uh, in the bit codes. Um, so it's able to see the whole program, and it can do a lot more optimizations on your code. Um, so so um, FLTO equals, you can say full. If you say full, what it does is it also generates the normal object code. 
say you're not using LTO. So what happens is when you're linking it, so you're providing it as a library and somebody doesn't want to use LTO or don't use LTO, you can still use that library. And if somebody is using LTO, they will of course have, so that's why it is called uh, full. And then the thin, it's faster to compile um, and has almost same amount of uh, you know, optimization gains you can do, but um, it needs gold linker. The reason is when it is doing linking, linking is a single process in full case. But in this case, uh, when you have gold linker, it can do threaded links. So what it does is um, uh, it launches many threads, so uh, that's, why, that's how it is able to um, do faster links. Um, so GCC has similar options, as you can see. Instead of generating LLVM uh, bitcode, it's generating Jimpool bitcode. Jimpool is the GCC's intermediate representation. And the rest of the process is pretty much same. And uh, there is a fuse linker option, linker plugin option, similar to what Clang has. And um, of course, it needs uh, linkers with plugin support. What that means is uh, Binoodles have this uh, plugin support. And you, when you have the linker with this support, it's able to call the other tools like Archiver, Size, all those tools. Um, basically, if you think those are uh, sort of uh, tools it is invoking when it is reading those objects and, and linking your application. Um, so there is this minus F fat LTO objects, uh, which basically is telling you that I want to generate these libraries that I can link both in LTO and non-LTO mode. And uh, one of the issues, caveats as usual, there are always um, compromises you make and uh, minus G might not work with this. Um, so there is some, there is work with, done in this area, but you might see that when you link your applications with LTO, debugging is even worse. So keep that in mind. Um, um, auto vectorization. Um, so there are multiple loop optimizations that are done underneath. So we're not going to talk about all of them, but um, um, we'll talk about just auto vectorization. So um, others are actually um, put together by your minus O options underneath. So they are doing a lot of loop optimizations. I highly encourage you look at those uh, loop options that you know compiler is doing. It's doing a fantastic job underneath. Um, so what auto vectorization does is nowadays all processors, you know, uh, in, in uh, embedded Linux space even have uh, some sort of SIMD units. Um, you know, ARM has NEON, right? There is the SSC units, AVX units on Intel x86, and then you have Altivec on PowerPC, MIPS has similar uh, things. So. Um, Auto vectorization is about using those units to speed up your compilation. Um, it's enabled at minus O3. If you don't use O3, then you can use minus F3 vectorize. This is a, speci a special option to enable it. And of course, you have to also enable this um, SSE options or Altivac. Otherwise, it will complain that, hey, you, know, you, you want to do vectorization, <coughs> but you don't seem to happen to have a SIMD unit. So what can I do? Um, How is it bad for size, then? Uh, sorry? You, you, you implied that it's bad for size uh, if it's only in O3. It is bad for size. I'll let you know how. Okay. Um, because what it is going to do at O3, so the uh, question was why O3 is bad for size. Because it is, by default, unrolling your loops. Right? So if you're unrolling your loops, it doesn't matter, forget about auto vectorization. It is doing a normal loop unrolling. So if your loop it finds is looping around 100 times, he's gonna unroll it four times, so the loop only runs 25 times, if it can do that. Because it is trying to save one of the branch instructions, right? Um, now it's again subjective uh, that it might improve your code uh, execution, but obviously, you are rep replicating code four times, so you know that's definitely adding to your code size. Um, what auto vectorization does 
is it identifies those codes um, snippets or loop um, loops, and then it tries to execute them using SIMD instructions. So if it is just running a normal loop instructions, right? There are a lot of instructions that it's doing. In this case, he's using all this SIMD power to do the calculations, whatever you are doing in your loop. So you can basically quickly execute that. That is what it is doing there. Um, it is enabled by default, so you don't have to do anything per se, but you can help the compiler when you write your loop and you think that, I think compiler should look harder in this loop here I wrote. It, I believe, is something compiler can uh, auto vectorize. Then you can help him by providing the hints through pragmas. Um, so the pragma I gave you is a, is a good option in Clang, for example, I found. Um, GCC has similar. Um, but it can tell, uh, you know, this particular pragma, you can put it above your loop and GCC will, or any compiler for that matter, uh, provided you put, use the right pragma there, will work harder to, to vectorize your loop. Um, and uh, there is uh, uh, more vec uh, vectorization features like um, uh, it can go beyond a single basic block. It can look across basic blocks and see, are we doing some similar operations in this block and this block, and they don't depend on each other, he will coalesce them together. So it's more aggressive optimization, takes a lot longer to compile, uh, but then it can give you a lot more you know, um, optimizations, so, uh, but you will lose compile time. So um, what I saw was that uh, compilers do support the uh, super word level parallelism. Um, Clang is uh, going a bit ahead and it's uh, um, also doing it in, in two, two phases. So first phase and the second phase is when it has done all restructuring, it will again run this pass. So if anything is now, it can catch second time when reordering happens, it will try harder to find more cases. Um, so target specific optimizations, so um, CPU type, uh, you know, there are uh, this mArch, mTune, mCPU options. Look very closely at them uh, when, you know, you are optimizing for your architecture. They are very, uh, they can give you a lot of, um, you know, uh, gain as well as pain, depends how you're using them. Um, so. MRH tells you what instruction sets you are allowing compiler to use. Um, if it is uh, choosing wrong instruction set, you know, you, you, it might use instructions that are not available on your processor. So it's very important to understand um, which, you know, architecture your CPU is using. Very important in embedded Linux. Uh, there are different CPUs and, you know, it's a, a plethora of them. and. Um, mTune, mTune tells the compiler for tuning the performance. So uh, they have different latencies for different instructions, to all machines. Um, so when you tell it with mTune, you're telling him this is the um, latency architecture that I'm uh, using it on, on a particular processor. So it will apply, so uh, at least compilers, they have all that data for scheduling. So it uses specific scheduling when you let it know that, you know, this is the tune that I'm trying to use. And MCPU tells it about what features you have, like, you know, ARM um, V8 has this security uh, encrypt extension, so do you want to use them or not? Um, uh, extra processing units that you have, so uh, you can use those options. Um, they are not to be used every time. Most of the time, you can get by uh, not using them. But if you have, uh, you know, performance critical applications, uh, they then you can use them. It, it helps a lot. Um, and um, you know, SIMD, as we talked about, auto vectorization. Use them uh, as much as you can. And um, and also, ABIs they also are able to use them nowadays. Um, you know, so you, for example, at least on ARM, ABIs are different depending upon how you want to pass your function parameters. 
Um, so you can use, for example, hard float ABI, which uses vector floating point for passing parameters. So if you have like, you know, audio related um, applications, then you can pass, you know, floats and doubles and all those things in using those registers. Um, and um, target ABIs, I just made a small note here, but uh, there are some obscurities there, especially in MIPS. And um, um, at least in the old ABI, you know, if you're using like big code, position independent code, then calls are very expensive. And uh, so there has been additional ABI work that has been done. And uh, MPLT, for example, helps it to reduce those three instructions to two instructions when you're making a call because, um, um, you know, you're letting it know that, you know, I have local PLTs. And um, you can explore more about target specific um, options using GCC target help. Uh, I didn't find any of that kind of, uh, you know, nice way in Clang that I could dump individual passes. Maybe there are ways, but uh, uh, there wasn't any like a, a given option that I could use. And uh, here I'm pointing you uh, to a, document, a documentation subsection uh, where it is actually documenting for all supported architectures what are architecture specific optimizations. So take a look at that, see which architecture you are building. So built-in functions. Um, built-in functions um, are provided to use specific instructions that compiler is not able to schedule. So when generally you are building your code, compiler only has a subset of instruction that it's using. But when you know that, oh, my algorithm involves this, you know, multiplications, um, then you can use built-ins to effectively uh, do those calculations. What it does is it uses those speci specific instructions that your architecture is providing to do those computations. And, uh, um, and the, the, so they are all documented really well. What I saw was they are different for different compilers, different for different architectures. So if you are using them, know what you are doing. And uh, uh, just don't use them without any guards. You know? So use guards around them if you are using them. Or sometimes uh, compilers are also able to use built-ins themselves. If they use it, then you are OK, because they know what, which architecture you are targeting, and they will do the right thing. But if you're explicitly using it in your code, then you, know, you have to be aware that the uh, particular built-in you're using here may not work on MIPS or may not work on PowerPC, for example. So um, unsupported GCC extensions in Clang. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, a highlight I'm making here because Clang is a newer compiler and does, doesn't support everything that's in uh, GCC. Um, and you would find that if you have existing code that has been built, say, with GCC, and uh, they, it may not directly compile. Uh, and some issues are just that it might be catching more errors that weren't ca caught by GCC. But then additionally, it can be that it hasn't implemented those. So there is a section, actually, that lists a lot more. I'm just listing here, which are mostly uh, relevant to a lot of software. So variable length arrays instructs. So this is a typical case that is found in uh, glibc. It's found in Linux kernel. Uh, and uh, Clang uh, communities will not implement this because uh, VLAs is not supported by any standard. So they don't want to implement it. Um, so if you have this kind of uh, code, then you, know, you have uh, a problem to fix. But there are ways to fix those too. So um, uh, for example, you know, at the same array, if your ending element is zero, then that's accepted. But um, the, the way they are used in GCC, uh, sorry, in glibc and uh, kernel is a little um, extensive. So built-in apply is another one. And uh, nested functions, again, um, I've seen it being used in glibc. There are several other components I've seen where the built-in functions are used. So they are not supported in, in Clang because they are not part of any C standard. Um, Built-in VAR pack, I don't know uh, where they are. I haven't encountered them, but uh, Clang um, website lists them as unsupported, so I believe they might have encountered them somewhere. Um, 
forward declaration of function parameters, this is very commonly found. So what you do is, um, you know, you declare an integer and then you pass that as a parameter right there. So when you are doing this VLA stuff, that's when you do it. So the number one and number four are tightly connected. Uh, so this is not accepted by Clang. So, um, so many times, you know, there were questions, oh, this works fine, and suddenly it's complaining. Uh, there's something wrong, but it's intentional that they don't want to support it. So there are other, uh, other things there. So uh, some things are uh, intentionally not supported, and some may be supported depending upon, you know, how the use cases are found. Yes, question. No. So it is, it is the forward declaration of function parameter. This is what it is. So you are declaring a function parameter. It takes one parameter. But you are declaring it and using it in the real parameter, which is your array. Uh, that's where you're using it. So it's a, it's a GCC extension. It's a smart thing, but uh, it's not standard. So I think, uh, uh, in summary, help the compiler. It'll help you. It's give and take. Uh, evaluate the impact of optimizations. Um, so, you know, one optimization may not work on a different load. So there are no, you know, uh, one way of doing all the time. So evaluate the impact always. Um, and know your cache sizes, your architecture, your uh, latencies. And um, uh, profile your code before you optimize. Data is the king. So if you know, um, you know, you collect the data, how your application is doing, you find most of the time people say, oh, the string functions, right? But it may not be the string functions. It may be something else. That's uh, it. Um, because in embedded space, you might have one of your own functions which is causing it and not a string function. So uh, very important that you have that profiling information uh, and then you identify, these are my 10 hotspots, and then just optimize those, you'll get a lot more. And then apply all these techniques there. I think impact will be a lot more, rather than doing a global level you know, change at minus, changing from minus O2 to OS and all those things. Those are very disruptive. And you have to no measure your load. Um, and writing portable code is good. Uh, we saw there are so many cases where portability can become a problem and you may not be able to take advantage of various tools. Um, and don't over-optimize. So many times it's, uh, it's a common pitfall people have is uh, they do over-optimization and it's actually called pessimization in compiler terms. Because um, you, know, you, you wrote a good code, compiler doesn't understand it anymore. So he says, okay, I'm going to do what best I can do. So compiler always falls back to, um, you know, very assertive, very conservative code generation when it doesn't understand the code. So he has to identify patterns, and if he doesn't, then he will fall back to, you know, the worst code it can generate because accuracy is more important for compiler. So he has to do the right thing, and whatever he thinks at that point, he cannot take chances. So. Uh, keep that in mind, write code that compiler can understand easily. So uh, that's all I had. So now I have uh, some time for questions. Actually, I'm above time already. So uh, we can uh, take one question. If not, thank you very much. <laughs>